Gospel lesson, the lesson for our sermon today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. A certain ruler asked him, asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and the age to come eternal life. This is God's word. Maybe you see that. Dear friends of Jesus, camels are big. Have you ever stood next to a camel? I learned that camels were big about 15 years ago when I took a trip to Israel. And for some reason, our tour group of people studying to be pastors, we, we stopped at some place in the middle of the desert in Israel. And when we got off the bus, there were some guys there with camels, like real Arab men with camels. And they offered to, to let us ride the camels if we paid the money, of course. Now, ironically, the one guy who wanted to ride a camel was by far the biggest person in our group. Now, this was a football player. He was well over 300 pounds. But he paid these guys some money to ride the camel. To get on a camel, the camel kneels down. So the camel knelt down, and this very large man climbed on the camel's back. And the camel stood up. And the moment the camel stood up, this man started screaming at the top of his lungs, Get me down, get me down, get me down. It was hilarious. It was just great. <laughs> when he finally got down, he explained, he said, when the camel stood up, he was way higher in the air than he ever expected to be. And he panicked. He said, get me down. And of course, the, the camel guys, they absolutely loved this. And they pretended that they didn't understand what he was saying. And so they made him stay up on this camel for a good long time. And I learned that camels are big. Even compared with a big 300 pound football player, camels are really big. So what are the chances that a camel can fit through the eye of a needle? You know that little tiny hole at the end of a needle? The truth is it's hard to thread, thread through the eye of a needle. You ever tried that? It's hard enough to get the thread to go through the eye of a needle. Right? So what are the chances a camel is going to go through? Is it like, like a 10% chance? Maybe, maybe like a 1% chance? Now how about like one in a million? No, it's impossible, right? It's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Well, there's something even more impossible. Jesus says that there is something even more impossible than a camel fitting through the eye of a needle. And he wants us to know what it is. It's saving ourselves. This is a really important story from God's Word. A man came up to Jesus and he said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's something really good and something really bad about that man's question. Let's start with the good. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Here's what was good. What was that man thinking about? Eternal life. Heaven. That's good, right? He wasn't thinking about football. He wasn't thinking about his next big vacation he was going to take. 
He was thinking about heaven, about eternal life. But here's what was bad. How did that man think he was going to get there? By earning it. Did you catch that? What must I do to inherit eternal life? He was convinced he was able to do something to earn heaven. So this man who thought he was good enough to earn eternal life, Jesus said, no one is good except God alone. You could probably have a whole sermon just on that one little phrase. No one is good except God alone. Because there's a little voice inside each one of us who doesn't believe that. No one is good, Jesus. Come on. I'm pretty good. Y'all are pretty good. Right? I mean, we're better than those people. We don't do the bad things that those people do. Just think about how we talk. We say, there's at least a little bit of good in everybody. Right? People are basically good. Right? And Jesus said, no one is good except God alone. Do you believe that? To prove it, Jesus said to this man, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not steal. Honor your father and mother. Those are five of the Ten Commandments. If you are wondering about order, Jesus says them in this order. Six, five, seven, eight, four. Do you think the order of those commandments matters? Not that much. But the commandments themselves do. Notice what Jesus uses those commandments to do. We often think to ourselves that the Ten Commandments are a good guide for us to get, live good lives. That the, the Ten Commandments help us be good. So what did Jesus just say about being good? No one is good except God alone. The Ten Commandments aren't a way for us to be good. Instead, the Ten Commandments show us what we're really like. The Ten Commandments show us our sins. What's the name for a thing that shows you what you really look like? A mirror. The best way to think about God's commands, God's law, is as a mirror because God's commands show us what we really look like. Do you like looking in the mirror? Your answer might age you a little bit, right? It kind of depends. There was somebody who didn't like looking in the mirror. In the days of Shakespeare in England, the queen was Queen Elizabeth, a different one than the one who just passed away. Queen Elizabeth I of England did not like looking in the mirror. In fact, over the last years of her life, she actually banned all mirrors from her presence wherever she went. And the reason why is pretty simple. She didn't want to see her beauty fading. She didn't want to see old age setting in. Historians say that Queen Elizabeth, by the end of her life, had black teeth and had lost most of her hair. But she didn't want to think about what she really looked like. Most of us could relate, right? Except Jesus says, you need to. You need a mirror. You need to look at God's commandments to see what you're really like. You shall not commit adultery. Jesus says that lusting after someone is the same as adultery. You shall not murder. Jesus says that hating someone is the same as murder. You shall not covet. Jesus says that desiring what someone else has, it's, it's just as bad as Stealing it. Honor your father and mother. Always. When you're young. Even when they're old. When you look at God's commandments, what do you see about yourself? I'm not good. I've sinned. Right? God's commandments are like a mirror that, that shows us what we're really like. And those are just five of the commandments. There's five more and a whole bunch of commands in the rest of the Bible. Do you see why Jesus said no one is good except God alone? Except this man, at least in his own opinion. This man thought that he was good. He said back to Jesus, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Is that not the most arrogant statement that has ever been said in the history of the world? 
I have kept every single one of God's commands ever since I was a boy. You want to say, hold on, time out. Let's find your mom, right? Let's call this guy's mom. Let's see what she said, or at least his brothers and sisters. Someone's got to find this man's brothers and sisters so that we can ask them, has this man kept every one of God's commands his entire life? And as much as I'm sure his mom loved him, what would his mom say? No, probably no way or not a chance. This man knew God's commandments, but he didn't know himself. You see how dangerous that is? This man saw what God said, but he couldn't see himself for who he really was. He needed a real mirror. And so Jesus gave him one more mirror. He said to him, you still lack one thing. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. What was that man lacking? Clearly he loved money. And clearly according to Jesus' words, he, he loved money even more than he loved God. And so without even realizing it, which command was he breaking? The first commandment. The very first commandment, you shall have no other gods. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The man hadn't kept all the commandments. He hadn't even kept the first commandments. He needed Jesus to hold up a mirror. To hold up the mirror of God's word so he could see what he was really like. No one's good except God alone, not even him. Told that when he heard this, he became very sad because he had great wealth. When something in your heart is above Jesus, what Jesus says always makes you sad. So we think of how I once counseled a, a young couple who were living together without being married. We talked about what the Bible says about marriage and, and sex. And when we got done, they said, we understand what the Bible says, but we're not going to do it. That's okay, right? And they said, no. It's not okay. And they went away sad. Because in their heart, something was more important than Jesus. And then when you run into Jesus, Jesus makes you sad. Let's talk with a, a Christian man who was using pornography. Again, we talked about what God says about marriage and sex. And this man refused to admit that using pornography was a sin. But he said, I'm still a Christian, right? It's okay. He said, no, it's not okay. And he went away sad and angry. You put something in your heart above Jesus. Coming in contact with Jesus is going to make you leave sad. That made Jesus sad too. He looked at this man and he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And how impossible is it for a camel to go through the eye of a needle? Completely impossible. His disciples understood what he was saying. They said, who then can be saved? If even this man, who by all earthly standards was, was at the top, right? He was, he was wealthy. He was a ruler. He was a morally good man who at least on the outside kept most of God's commandments most of the time. If even this man couldn't earn his way to heaven, who then can be saved? Right? If, if to keep the commandments means keeping all of the commandments, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with man this is impossible. Trying to save yourself, it's like mission impossible. Because no one is good except God alone. It's sort a of story about a pastor who, who preached a sermon that, that really pointed out the sin in people's hearts. After the service, as people were walking out of church, a, a lady came up to the pastor and she said to him, Pastor, as you were preaching today, you made me feel like this big. Right? And she really put her finger and her thumb about as close together as she could without them touching. Pastor, you made me feel like this big. And you know what the pastor said? 
That's still too big. <laughs> He's right. Jesus doesn't say, you know, there's this much of a chance for you to earn your way into heaven. What does Jesus say? There's no chance. Because there's no one good except God alone trying to save ourselves. It's like mission impossible. So what hope is there? Well, just this. Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Christianity is not like this to-do guide about how to improve yourself. Too often people talk like that today. Christianity is a story of how God came to save us who can't help ourselves. When you feel like you're this big, when you see yourself for who you really are, don't turn away from Jesus. Follow Jesus' invitation. He said to that man, come, follow me. When you realize your sins, don't, don't turn away from Jesus. Hear his invitation. Come, follow me. What is impossible with man is possible with God. There's another place in the Bible where we hear that nothing is impossible with God. Can you remember what other story in the Bible we hear those words? Nothing is impossible with God. It's the day that the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary to tell her that she was going to give birth to God's son. And Mary said, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And what did Gabriel say back to her? Nothing is impossible with God. Let's think about how when it comes to saving us, God has done two impossible things. It should be impossible for God to become a human being like us. Right? It's impossible. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Became a human being like you and me. It should be impossible for sinners like us to live forever in heaven with our perfect God. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He lived and he died and he rose so that we can live with God. Jesus has done the impossible. When Jesus was on earth, he, he perfectly obeyed every single one of God's commands. Every single one in his thoughts and his words and his deeds. He could even ask his mom, Mary. She knew, right? Mary knew that her son was perfect and she was not. You could even ask Jesus' brothers, right? It'd be pretty hard to convince your brothers that you were perfect, don't you think? And yet two of Jesus' brothers actually wrote books of the Bible about Jesus. Do you know which two books of the New Testament are written by Jesus' brothers? James and Jude. Jesus was actually able to convince his own brothers that he was perfect. How do you think that's, the, that's possible? Because he is. Jesus is the one person who actually was good. And then he made a trade with you. Jesus traded you and me, his goodness. And what did we give to him? All of our sin. The Bible says that God made him who had no sin, the one perfect person, to be sin for us. So in him we could become the righteousness of God. At the cross of Jesus, he made this trade. He took all of our sins upon himself and he gave us all of his goodness. So this is how you have eternal life. By believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior. By faith in Jesus, we have eternal life. Isn't that a better way? Isn't God's way better? You could have this, this six-step guide for how to improve yourself, but you wouldn't do it, right? God could tell you and me, do this and do this and do this, and then maybe you'll get into heaven. But how many of us, we've got a hundred things we know we're supposed to do. And how many of them do we actually do? It's impossible for us to save ourselves. And so what the Bible says is, it's done. Jesus did it. Jesus did it for you. Your life isn't all about your working and your striving and your earning. It's about what Jesus did for you at the cross. Whoever believes in him has eternal life. Maybe that's why God sometimes allows us to be sad. 
kind of an interesting thing in this story. This man actually walks away sad. And Jesus lets him go. Sad. Because that's what that man needed that day. That day that man needed to be sad. Because he needed to realize that his heart was in the wrong place. That he was looking for joy and comfort in the wrong things. Making him sad was a blessing from Jesus that day. We don't hear any more about this man in the Bible, but we hope that on a future day, he came back to Jesus and he said, save me. And Jesus would have smiled and would have welcomed him into his kingdom. Sometimes God blesses us by making us sad. Can you see that? What do my disappointments show about my own heart? In the middle of all your discouragements, can you hear Jesus calling you to him? When you have pain, can you hear Jesus' voice calling you to look away from yourselves to him? Making us sad, sometimes the blessing of God, telling us the hard truth, that's a blessing from Jesus. So that ultimately we say to Jesus, just like his disciples then did, who then can be saved? So that Jesus can look at us and he can smile and he can say, with man this is impossible, but not with God. When the day comes that you realize that you're not actually good. When the day comes that you realize that you're not as strong as you thought you were. When the day comes that you realize that your body is, is weak. Then follow Jesus. What is impossible with man is possible with God. When the people whom you've counted on let you down. When the things that you've loved break. When the plans that you've made fall to pieces. Follow Jesus. What is impossible with man is possible with God. When you think about heaven and eternal life, when, when you face death, when you want something in your life that's so much more than what this world offers, follow Jesus. Because what is impossible with man is possible with God. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we're grateful that this man came to you thinking about eternal life. Just like him though, Lord, we struggle with some of the wrong thoughts. We come to you thinking that we're good. That we just got to do a couple things, tweak a couple things, and then we'll be good for eternal life. You use your commandments today like a mirror to point out what we're really like. You drive home this truth that no one is good except God alone. But you do that with a purpose. You show us our sins so that we can stop looking at ourselves and we can look to you. Like the people, we say, who then can be saved? And you make us this promise, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Dear Jesus, as we live our lives for you on earth, help us not to love anything more than you. May your death on the cross and your life fill our hearts with joy and contentment as we follow you. Help us not to look to ourselves but to look to you because what is impossible with us is truly possible through you. In your name we pray, amen.